going to go ahead and get started with our uh, next presenter uh, who is already on the line. And, um, you know, we welcome you to this 2017 Black Sustainability Summit question and answering session. If this is your first time. If you are just joining us, uh, we've had a couple people just join the line and we thank you all and welcome you. We've had a really beautiful dialogue for the last several hours with presenters and folks from across the world. Um, folks from across the U.S., so um, give thanks to that, and we want to continue that and move into uh, Brother uh, Amin Seb's presentation about uh, African preparedness and uh, African survival. Um, and so I'm going to uh, give you the uh, power to uh, co-share screens, I'll try to share some parts of the video as you talk, and uh, let you kind of give a brief introduction, and, and you can open up the floor, open up the floor for questions. All right, give thanks. Hotep and greetings to all of you. Can you hear me all right? Greetings, right. Baba. Okay, greetings, greetings. I uh, definitely want to say give thanks for the opportunity, the time of being here with, the, with you, the group here for the second annual Black Sustainability Summit. Uh, give thanks to uh, Brother Elisa, Mama Nibantu, Sister Raina for putting this together and, you know, getting everybody here organized and coming together for such a powerful and impacting type of a presentation throughout these past couple of days. And uh, I really give thanks to being a part of this and being here. Uh, my name, Brother Armin Sef, Bob Armin Sef. Uh, I'm the director of uh, the Black the Nature Survival and Preparedness Foundation group organization, as well as the Harambe Connection. I do uh, multimedia networking and uh, the survival and preparedness is done through Black the Nature as uh, where we provide classes, workshops. We have Marketplace. There's quite a bit of things that's offered there to get uh, the community more involved into what it is about survival and preparedness. As I listen to a lot of the presentations uh, throughout these couple of days and um, up to recent, even though these presentations here with the Q and A's, uh, a lot of things that is shared through and within the survival and preparedness, African family survival and preparedness is very relevant because it's really connecting us to the things that we need to do for ourselves, defining, refining our character or our narrative of what it is we're doing and how we go about it. You know, a lot of times when it comes to survival and preparedness, a lot of times folks initially just think of um, camping or being in the outdoors. And I always make mention of that. Yes, it is a serious component. It is a component, but it's not the only part of when uh, as I pertain to, or as I share with uh, many about survival and preparedness, it's not just about knowing how to camp and handle gear and so on, but it's about our survivability, uh, what it is we're doing and how we're preparing ourselves as uh, individual, as family, as community, to be able to progress into what we call survivability, not just surviving in an atmosphere, a place, or a time, or conditions, but being able to take ourselves beyond that and be able to become successful within it. So that was the outline or is the outline of what I've, been, what I've shared here in the presentation for those of you who have been able to see it. And um, I do I appreciate the responses that I've received and the uh, uh, feedback that I've already been getting from you. So at this point, I mean, we're here for a Q&A. So if there's anything that you have for me or would like to find out more about what's going on, uh, the floor is open. I definitely have a question. This is Brother DJ. Yes, sir. Um, I've had an opportunity to do a little bit of the training, which is so so needed, that survivability uh, skills. So what would you suggest as like a survivability pack for people like us who uh, you know live or work or in and out the metropolitan areas? Oh, well, that's, What's that's the things we need to do? That, that's the critical part because when we talk about survivability or survivability, it's not just in one kind, one kind of a format. We have, we're all living in different environments, different locations, whether it be urban, rural, um, off the grid, or how we may teach church to term it. So they are, how we are conditioned or we're faced with different type of conditions, whether they're natural or man-made, it doesn't matter. So how do we prepare for these things? We first have to gather ourselves and you know uh, uh, identify what is the environment that we need to, uh, what we're embracing and what you're embracing and what you need to really uh, gather for your immediate group. Uh, we there's a lot of things when it comes to herbal survival that may be urban survival that would be different from rural survival. 
but then the things don't really change. What are the needs, the necessities, the areas that you need to prepare? How do you need to prepare? Who are you working with? Just as you heard in other presentations, community and those that you're dealing with, that trust factor, that building with the network must be something that's identified and developed. And as you begin to do that, then you're able to now identify the needs of the group and move from there. So in an urban environment, differing from what we would say is rural or even off grid, uh, there, there are a lot of things that somewhat are the same when it comes to the uh, basics of what your survival is. Uh, we're based around uh, uh, obtaining food, water, shelter, the type of mi mindset that we need to have and working with one another, even for individual self, and then just basic traits that we have to know how to uh, move around. So when we are in an urban environment, we can be victimized or compromised by natural disasters or conditions or man-made, how are we going to respond to it? How do we do that? And, and the best practices is within our families. Once we know how to engage within family first, or even within ourselves, but then in the family unit, then we're able to start to see how we respond, how we're able to uh, maneuver through things, how we're able to deal with uh, obtaining the necessities for our, our survivability, and then now how to embrace others within the community and engage each other in the community, uh, not just in the trust area, but in the way of knowing how to rely on other people's sources. We can't do it all our own. So our sources comes within the, the scope of community. And that's where when we look at the urban aspect of it, uh, we have a little bit more accessibility to what we call that outer family, that community aspect, and is now being able to connect with those efficiently to gather those resources and connect with the many things that we need. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. But I was I was wondering also, and I do appreciate you answering it, brother. Thank you so much. Um, you know, like sometimes the little survival packs. What, what would you suggest that we would need to, you know, like the backpack survival kit? You know, the, the basics. What we need to be looking at to have as even a starter kit, because I, I, sometimes we don't have anything. Okay, I got what you're saying now. When it comes to your, your packs and your kits, um, there's some basics that you want to consider. What do you have? And those basics cover those basic elements of survival, which would be, what do you have for containing water, carrying water? And regardless of where you are, whether it's urban again, how do you carry water? Whether it's a plastic bottle, a container, what are the things that you have to, if you're in need of water or acquiring water, you have to have something for water. You have to have something for fire. Fire is an is a element that we use for a number of things. So whether it's matches, fire starters, strikers, lighters, what are the ways that you can uh, obtain and bring about the type of fire that you need? It might be something that you need to purify your water. Uh, your, your power might go out, and I don't know if many of you may have gone through that experience of, of losing power. We have to make adaption and changes. So the things that you would need is something to carry your water, contain your water, food, ample amount of food. Now, when you talk about packs, one of the things I do share and train and teach you about is 72 hour kits and their basic bug out bags or survival kits people call them by different things but one of the important factors when we talk about 72 hours and in any type of situation your first 72 hours are your most critical because that's when it, 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 people are still in a state of panic uh, confusion disarray and your 72 hours are very important so that 72 hour kit that pack that you're asking about you have to have the most vital and important things that you can rely on regardless of where you are. So that in a time of need, you could just go into that bag and have those things. First aid, water security, food security, uh, um, something for shelter, emergency shelter uh, uh, needs. And then, um, again, I said first aid because something that may not be on our basic survival list as you see on the screen, but it's one of those things that, how do I can um, aid to the different uh, areas of need? I travel constantly, and I don't think there's any place I don't go if it's a little bag that I throw over my shoulder, or even if you're not in a place where you can have any bag, because you talk about kids, is what do we carry on ourselves on a continuous basis? So your everyday carry also supplements what you may consider as your survival kit, knowing what you have on you at any time, wherever you are, to be prepared, and that's part of your preparedness. So I hope that helps a little bit more. There's a lot of different things that we can go into about preparing and how you prepare your kits and what is needed 
is no one solution or one all type of thing. You may want a knife, you may want a flashlight, you may want first aid, container, fire starter, fire striker. Um, might be something to actually even buy the time, some a piece of cordage for ropes to, to, to be able to do something and, and some form of a shelter. So you cover the different type of things based on where you are, the type of elements that you may be faced with, the conditions, and know if I don't have these things, how can I acquire, how can I get it? And there's different types of bags that you may, or packs that you may want to assemble for these type of things. So you may want one specific for your vehicle, because if you travel a lot, you may want to have something specifically for your vehicle that will have uh, the type of needs that uh, would help you in your, in your travels. If your person is walking around or you're on foot a lot, then, or you have the accessibility to carry things around with you, then you may travel a little bit differently. If you're at home, your pack may be something that you, you want to have a type of pack for an emergency if you're in an environment that, that calls for a sudden emergency that you would need to have, which is your, your, your go-to bag or a bug out bag that has certain things that's equipped. So there are different types of kits or packs, but then you have to know how to prepare for them. That's some of the things that we um, train and share within the Black to Nature classes and workshops so that you can gear yourself up and know how to not just have these things, but know how to use them as well. Uh, I think that's excellent, Papa, and uh, thank you for going through that. Um, one of the things that I really liked, um, and I'm going to see if I can come back to it, was uh, you talked about the plan, organize, equip, train, exercise, evaluate. I think you, uh, re I think you <laughs> repeated that about eight times. And I did it in a different way. No, I, I know, I know, and I think it's really important. I think another piece you talked about was how um, – you know, you know, it needs to be implemented into daily practice. And yes. so if you could talk about those two pieces, because I think they're um, very important for this, how do we implement it to daily practice? And you also talked about the children and bringing them in too. So, and we've got Baba um, DJ Asante on the phone who's dealing with children yes. and families in both Mississippi and Senegal. So how can he bring these practices in with the young people he's working with so that they're learning how to plan I how to have daily practices that deal with these things. Very good. I appreciate the question. And um, that preparedness cycle that's there on the screen that's being shown is a very key element. And even when I shared within the presentation about that preparedness cycle, wherever you are, whoever you are, wherever you are in your level of preparedness, it doesn't matter what part of that cycle that you begin with, whether it's the beginning stages of planning or organizing, gathering equipment, training your exercise and, and training and exercise is different when you train with the things that you uh, you engage or you organize around or with people that you can connect with but your exercise this is those um, scenarios that you build up the routines that you practice then you do evaluations now this, this cycle it doesn't matter at what point and the repeatedness that you heard in the uh, presentation was because you could be at the beginning of exercise we're in a form of doing exercises. We have scenarios. We, we did present different types of scenarios. You heard Barbara Wakesa talking about the family law project, engaging the students, the young ones, into a different level of practice so they can see it on a different uh, or approach their mindset in a different way. Now they're in the exercise mode. They're in the mode of uh, going through a scenario, finding probabilities of how to deal with it. That might be the start point or the point that you choose to work with and work from. And then you go immediately to evaluating. Well, what did we learn from this? How do we build up and change? So that's where the cycle comes in as a very important part. Now, how do we put this into a daily routine is as we begin to, as you begin to choose uh, a, a modality of survival and preparedness, the two things are separate. They, even though we say them together, survival and preparedness, there are two different aspects. Your mode of what survival is and what it means and how you're going to embrace it then how are you going to prepare for that? Again, because we're in different um, environments, we're in different conditions, our survival mode would be different from each other. But then the preparedness is a point that I'm not, I cannot prepare where I live in Virginia. I'm not preparing for earthquakes as I might prepare for tornadoes and hurricanes um, and so on and so forth. Now, how do we get the children involved? Uh, very, you know, I had that challenge when I was doing this on a homeschool cooperative and uh, it was some of this material that you heard here was taught to youth as far as young as seven years old. 
and we had to meet them where they were. So meet them where they were was developing type of uh, scenarios when those, within those exercises to see, well, what, how do you see these things? Do you have, and when you engage the family concept, do families, do you hear families have a fire safety plan? Now we could all relate to that regardless of where we live. If there's a fire in your home, in the apartment, next door to us, regardless of where it is, what is your family emergency plan? These are things that you work with your children and knowing how to engage and connect so that it's not a panic situation. It's a mode that they now know how to respond to and react to or condition themselves to, this is what I need to do first. And it's not so much, well, I'm going to just panic because I smell smoke and there's a fire. And then, you know, we, we, we have to know how to react. And it creates a, a point of knowing how to respond rather than just react to a situation. So this is where the family involvement comes in. It could be, what do you do or how, I don't know how many here, I've done this in workshops, how many people have been without power, electricity for a certain amount of time. And we all rely on communications, our internet, mobile, and, and computers. But what happens when the electricity goes out? How do we now communicate around that, outside of that? How do we engage in each other? Do we have enough family time or interaction to communicate the different areas when it comes to not having power. Again, this now involves our youth. So with that type of scenario, we can put the preparedness aspect into it. Now, without power, what are you gonna do first? What are the different approaches? Do you have a plan when we don't have power? How are you gonna obtain water in the house? Where are you gonna go? What are you gonna do first? What are you not gonna do? Are you gonna flush the toilet, just go use the toilet randomly, flush it, or maybe waste some or lose some of the water you have? Do you know where to get water in the house? things that we start to engage our children in and then show them how to do it. It's not just um, presenting material or just information only, but it's now engaging them in the application of knowing what to do and how to do it. So it's not something that uh, just for the children, for the entire family, the household, doing these things on an everyday basis. I challenge some of the students that many times to say, um, try doing that for a day in your home. Go to the power board, switch it off, at least for, the, for, for most of your things, and see what it's like doing or being without power for at least a day. And, and then, then go, let's go to the evaluation part of that preparedness cycle. What did we learn from that? What did you experience? How did it make you feel? Were you uncomfortable? With the, did, were you, where were your reliabilities on when it comes to the electricity and not having it? How do we function? How do we prepare our food? How do we do without light when it got darker in the evening time? different things that we can start to just practice in the home rather than just constantly thinking it's only where I just need to go out in the outdoors and do it. But then that's the other part, knowing how to um, participate in a, in a urban or a, not urban, a rural or a wilderness or a camping type experience. But now you're taking those elements and those practices of basic survival into another level. I hope oh. that answers that. Yes. Hi. Oh. Oh, this is the Erasy Hope from Dallas again. Um, I wanted to ask about um, if vitamin D, the need, um, the the specific uh, part of vitamin D and melanin, if uh, if that plays a part on how much, you know, in a situation where we had, let's say, we had to uh, hide in a or stay in a place without sunlight. Um, do you have do you talk about how how much we have a need for vitamin D from the sun or you know it's been talked about lactose intolerance and and different things that come from our melanin and I'm kind of confused different people Francis West Wilson used to say one thing we can hurt different things that, but that, um I'm wondering, wondering about that and then my well, my second question is also about um how many calories per day should we be able to survive on in a situation? I know like on certain diets, they say 1,000 calories a day minimum we should eat. And uh, I was wondering what you all thought. If, I, mean, if, I mean, you thought if you were trying to learn how to survive on less food, um, what, what you would practice is how much the least amount of food you can have, you know, in practicing uh, survival, survival skills or shrinking your stomach and, and that type of thing. Great. Yeah, two, two great questions. And I mean, there are also sub questions to that. And I appreciate that. Um, one of the important areas when it comes to uh, understanding our food, our nutrients, 
uh, I don't, and I don't really always focus on any one particular area, as you mentioned, vitamin D, for example, is a very critical, important part for our um, sustainability as far as a melanative people. But then we have to be able to adapt to situations when it comes to our survivability, because uh, this brings us into the point of knowing and understanding the type of food sources that we have available to us and regardless of where we are. So if it's an urban area and environment, we have to know what is available to us, how are we gonna maintain uh, our water and food type of security so that when we are in a situation, we will know how to manage and be able to maintain the best of health and conditions. Now, when it comes to nutrition and uh, the nourishment of our bodies, not everybody's um, health situation is the same. So it comes back to also knowing how to connect, reconnect back to nature. Now if we're in a rural or, or wilderness type situation, we have to be more familiar, more aware of, learn more of what is out there, what the natural things have to offer us within our food. So how do we get vitamin D from different type of plant sources? Where are we gonna find that from? So that uh, we're not looking at a little container or a bottle to open up and say, well, I could pop a pill to maintain my nutritional value, but how am I gonna get that in the food? Uh, in a in a disaster type of situation, this is where the preparedness comes in. If I have access to the type of things that I know that will help sustain me as an individual, cause a certain type of health conditions, or whoever might be in the family, the, from children to elderly, our homes are made up differently. So we have to know now how do we um, meet the needs of everybody in that family. And this is where it comes in. This and you seen on the screen how we know how to now acquire what type of food, what type of water and how much we're gonna need for everybody, how we're gonna be able to acquire what's best for each person, and know what the alternatives are. Uh, know what the alternatives are in your everyday accessibility, as well as when it comes to a place where I can't go to the store and obtain these things. When we're in a, uh, an emergency type situation, access to food will run out. Even when we store food, how are we storing our food and preparing so that we would have enough for a sustainable amount of time. It's up to us, it's up to you, you to determine how long that time will be to know what type of foods you need to have for how many people. So then now you can supplement. So it's not just a focus on any one thing. Now the other part of the question, how many uh, type of calories and you know, when it comes to really kind of toning down and fine tuning, that also is another, uh, is no, no one rule of thumb of that because again, everybody has a different area of need. Now, if we were to say on an average, 1,600 to 2,000 calories is a minimal as the type of food you need, but then based on what type of calories are you putting in? Uh, are you getting the high carb calories, low carb, so, or the protein type of calories? We have to determine what type of calories, caloric intake are we benefiting from that's gonna help sustain us you know, for that period of time. So this goes back to even like in the previous question about your 72 hour kit, when you put together even your, your food for your first 72 hours, what is most important to you, the person for 72 hours? Because 72 hours, anything can happen, but if you cannot maintain that, your mind starts to play games on you, you realize that I'm not prepared, I'm not ready. And this applies to your food questions because in your nutritional values, because then if I, I do not have the things that I need, that I know that I need for self, or start to acquire for self, then I'm in a sense of vulnerability. And that's not the position we want to be in when it comes to preparedness. And we, can't prepare, we cannot survive if we're not prepared. So when it comes down to, I, I never write, try to focus too much on exact amount of um, calories as needed, but then we have to know how uh, to sometimes fast. And that's a way in preparing and training ourselves. How can I do without? Uh, I've shared that in presentations. If we prepare, uh, if we practice that, on a, on a basis of knowing how to put aside certain things and, and fast on different areas, then I would know how much my body can take and how much I can go without having certain things. Document these things and know how you are affected by that to know how well you can continue within a type of a situation. I hope that helps. And if there's anything more I could add to that, please let me know. Yes, yes. And, and I have one follow-up, a little quick question sure. is if you have, tips on how to stay cool um you know a lot of us have been in air condition so long that we've forgotten some of the old school things and i know back when i used to live with my grandparents we used to sleep on a pallet on the floor and then i that you know because heat rises that it 
it's sometimes cold, you know, cooler on the floor. And then I notice when I, if I wear a polyester uh, shirt versus a cotton shirt, then I'm cooler, you know, wearing uh, breathing fabrics, cotton, um, wearing lighter colors. <laughs> Um, is there any other like little tips uh, for staying cooler in hot environments where you, you know, don't have air conditioning and and, and that 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 might be helpful in in hot situations? In, in, in the short answer to the question, don't do too much. <laughs> but <laughs> but in a more serious sense, no. The, what you bring up is a very important point because um, today we uh, we have access to a lot of different types. You mentioned clothing and types of materials that benefit us and help us in different conditions. And where you are may make a difference from another person's location. This is something we have to keep in mind. Where you plan on going, we have to consider what is best. Now, how to keep cool, you know, it's, uh, it's based on sometimes, even in a hot time, if you notice um, folks that are in desert environments, you know, sometimes they have a lot of clothes on, more clothes mm -hmm. than you think that <laughs> have so much clothes on, and how do you stay cool with that much clothes heads are covered their bodies sometimes everything but a lot of times when your body temperature is high or in a in a low temperate zone when it begins to get hotter the peeling off of your clothes sometimes makes it makes a difference when i say you're taking off layers in other words but having layers of clothes clothing not always just the type of clothing but layers makes a difference so that when you're in a hotter condition you'd be surprised you may be able to maintain it when uh, rather than exposing your body sometimes to that openness of the heat, not so much the sun, but just the heat exposure, the clothes does protect you at times. So it sometimes works in a, in a reverse way of thinking about how you prepare and what you do where in the type of condition. Now, the more you do, the more is going to be required of, uh, you know, your, your physicality as far as what you're doing. The less you do, that's why I said it jokingly at first, don't do too much. Where you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not stressing your body out to a level that you have to worry about keeping cool. But then there's times where you're just gonna have to find other ways in doing that, and that comes into different lessons on how you do it. Just a quick tip: it, there's no one way, but the question is great. Thank you. Yeah, I know about being still. <laughs> you you get cool if you just stay still a little while. And that could also Thank work against you too. I'm sorry. I said that also can work against you too, because if you're not moving, if your body's not moving in movement, then being still too long can work against your, your muscle, the, the flow of your blood, the flow of water that you have inside. So we have to acquire a certain type of movement and activity. It keeps our brain going as well, and it triggers the proper the reaction to how we respond to situations. Oh, okay. <laughs> so complicated. Thank you. Yes. Uh, very powerful, uh, Baba. We appreciate all of this. And I just want to open up for um, any last questions. We've got about a minute left. Um, I haven't seen any come in through the chat. All right. Um, so um, I want to give you an opportunity to make a closing. I want to thank everybody for coming out to this uh, Q&A session. Um, again, as we said in the last one, um, next year, the goal is to have uh, we will be in Atlanta next year doing um, in-person uh, summit as well as a portion of it being online and continuing to collect mm -hmm. videos from folks doing the work. So we appreciate you all. Uh, any final words, Bob? Well, first, uh, once again, I just give thanks. I, I really appreciate the questions here today because each one is very important and they just show how there's different aspects as far as and approaches that we need to take. And that last um uh, clip that you showed about developing paradigms, establishing new paradigms, I believe is a very important factor that we need to do. We have to change the scope of our thinking from how we address things and the paradigms is how, and the last part that I really like is because the paradigm that you create, the paradigm that you consider, the paradigms that you embrace is the way you will determine how you will survive and what you will live for and what you will die for. And I think that's very important. And the paradigms that we have and can choose, as you see there, if you've been listening to the presentation, they come in many formats. But uh, that last part, I, I really like that because it's going to say what you're going to live in, what you're going to die for, the steps that you're going to take. I like what Bob and Casey said in his presentation, where it said, this is a good day to die. But then if we're not prepared or have not done certain things and aspects to what we are dying for, 
it's a good day to die, but based on what? Based on whose paradigm and what paradigm and the way we are living our life. And that survivability going and moving on to the following generation. Because our lives can be taken at any point, but what, ha what has been given to the next generations to live by? What is that plan of effect for at least seven generations to come within our households and our families so that they can survive and not you know, go through some of the same conditions that we have and have been facing even currently? So I do give thanks once again for you all, your participation, connecting here today, connecting at the, uh, with the presentations. Um, any further information, you can get to me at info at blacktonetcher.com or go to the website and just follow up with the website is blacktonetcher.com and you will be able to get my contact information there, subscribe there to get involved. I have an open house coming up on June 1st at 6.30 Eastern time where I'm there to answer more questions, share a little bit more about what we're doing there on the site throughout Black Tonetcher. And um, uh, once you go over there, just shoot me your email, give me information. That way I can send you a, a direct invitation so you don't always just have to come to the site each time. Uh, you'll be able to get a notification of what we're doing, what's upcoming, and that way you'll be able to follow through with some of the presentations. Absolutely. Uh, give thanks, Baba. Deep gratitude for that. And uh, we appreciate your time as always. A great addition to the summit. We look forward to much more. Um, we're going to take this time now to